Um, but thank you so much for this incredible work that you've done, and, and I think for the courage and vulnerability that you showed uh, to stand up and do something that I think a lot of us pause before we do the things that maybe we're feeling called to do, and you did it. Um, so what moved you to, to take that story and, and work with Linda and turn that into this documentary film and share it with the world? Well, this is probably like a teen answer, but um, I um, was going through, obviously, the time of my life. Um, not a good time, a bad time. Um, and so I had friends helping me check email. Um, so I wasn't checking my email myself, but a girlfriend said, a woman has emailed and she wants to do a documentary. And she's a Wheaton College graduate and she's won Emmy Awards and um, was an executive producer on some of the first reality shows to hit TV. Um, some of you may have watched Gangland on Discovery. Discovery Channel? History Channel. Um, that was one of the earliest documentaries, um, well, not documentaries, reality TV shows. Um, love them or hate them, blame her. Um, <laughs> but I was like, well, my life's already crazy. Um, and I didn't know what it would be like, and I didn't assume it would be like the Kardashians. I assumed it would be like documentaries like I show in my classes, right? Informative. Um, something that people can read themselves into art in a way that maybe they can't other things. Art opens us up to different possibilities. Um, so whether it's songs or film or TV or poetry, literature, etc. And so that was the reason I thought, well, why not? You know, it just means the camera's around while all this stuff is going down. But she can talk about her process if you want. But that's what I was thinking. What, Linda, what made you catch on to this and want to reach out to her and walk this journey with her? Well, um, as Rachel mentioned, I am a graduate of Wheaton College. Um, and so when this story initially broke in December 2015, I, like a lot of my classmates and still friends, you know, I was mesmerized by the story. And initially, it was just that, like, wow, there's this massive controversy happening at my school. Um, but as it unfolded, um, there were so many issues that, that were being hinted at and discussed. Um, and that was, you know, rich content. But what really grabbed my attention was seeing how alumni have, were splitting over the issue um, and what a polarizing thing this was. So you had some people that felt like, you know, okay, this was sort of a Jesus-y thing that she did. I understand what she was trying to do. You had other people that felt like she was a heretic. And in December 2015, this was really remarkable. This is not really remarkable now. Like we all live with so much polarization that it's much more remarkable when we're unified about anything. Um, but at the time, it was like, wow, this is crazy seeing people who, you know, share so much in terms of the teaching of Christianity that they received and just could not be more opposite in how they are viewing this. And so really, that's the reason I did the film, because I was so fascinated with what is beneath this, why is this happening, why is this so controversial, why can't we find a way to come to some sort of agreement. Um, and so the, the title of the film, Same God, yes, is a reference to the question do Muslims and Christians worship the same God, but it's also really a tongue-in-cheek tongue question of um, do evangelicals worship the same God? Good question. I would put it back out there, but um, we, we want to cut off before midnight. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's a really important question that we, we ask ourselves in the era of 2020 when we are so divided. Um, where can we sit together and have a conversation? Where is a starting point for us? And um, as two religious leaders up here as well, how can we um, engage in interfaith dialogue and find ways to be in community together and be at the table together and walk in solidarity together. And I think 
think that's where this journey in part started for you and that sense that you felt that calling during uh, the liturgical season of Advent to walk in solidarity with our sisters. And, and tell me, was there something that happened in you or a particular story or encounter with a particular um, friend or neighbor that said, you know, I need to stand with them? So um, as the film portrays those events that happened in quick succession, um, the um, San Bernardino um, shootings. Um, and quickly after that, Donald Trump made his statement about the Muslim ban. And if you recall, he was candidate Trump, not President Trump at the time. And then after that, Jerry Falwell Jr. made his statement, which then brings um, like a school like Wheaton squarely into focus, um, being like, it's not just a Christian college, it's really a flagship evangelical school. Christianity Today is a stone's throw from Wheaton College. Um, it's a strange center um, of the evangelical universe. You would think it would be somewhere like Oklahoma or Texas, like, y'all got Hobby Lobby. Um, but <laughs> that up in Chicago, is Christianity Today and all of the Christian publishers, right? Um, and Hobby Lobby makes its way up to Chicago, you know, all that stuff, all those cases, Supreme Court cases. But um, but it's a, it's a very conservative religious place. You know, they say there are more churches per capita in DuPage County, where Wheaton is located, than anywhere else in the country. And I'm like, well, they haven't been to Oklahoma. <laughs> um, and the buckle of the Bible belt, where it's spelled Baptist with two Bs. Um, but the reality, I'm home, so I can talk like that. No, I'm kidding. I love it. Um, and you laugh at me, it's great. I tell my students that jokes are funny. But, um, but the reality is, it's a very, and I mean this in the religious sense of the word, it's a fairly religious, conservative place um, and a wealthy suburb. And Wheaton is right there in the middle of it all. And when Jerry Falwell Jr. said what he did from chapel, I think you got the reference. He was saying he had a gun in his pocket from a pulpit. And that if Muslims walked in, we should be ready to kill them. That's what he said. And I was like, H, no. That's not the universe that my nephew and my students get to inherit. And two of my students wrote an op-ed, and they said, Professor Hawkins, will you read this op-ed? Will you edit it for us? And I read the op-ed, and I was like, y'all, I have nothing to add. This is what I taught you to do. This is who I taught you to be, to embody justice, to be an embodied question mark to the world, because that's what I think the prophets do. That's what I think Jesus does in his body. Everywhere he goes, he's stirring up trouble, because justice is his being. And when you bring light to the darkness, you get stones thrown at you. Prophets get killed because they're bringing attention to the corruption in the world. And that's what my two students did in an op-ed. And then another student came to me and said, I want to wear a hijab on the airplane home and get all my college student girlfriends to wear a hijab on the airplane home too. And it was just this like, she's going to do this and she's going to go out on Facebook. And I was like, well, maybe we should talk to our friends in the Muslim community because Perhaps this is considered haram, unclean, defiling of this beautiful um, religious um, act of worship. So we can't just put a scarf on our head and assume that it's okay and that we're evincing solidarity. So I called my friends at the Council on American Islamic Relations in Chicago because I served on the board with two Muslims. And what's interesting is the majority of Muslims I knew at the time were men. Um, two friends from grad school, a couple of friends from undergrad, and then two men that I served on the board with. So they consulted the women at the organization, and it kind of went from there. But they said, we think that you will have the right spirit. Let's make this an educational thing. And have your students keep a journal about what it's like to wear the hijab on the airplane home and on the way back from school, because, you know, Christmas holidays coming up. Um, and Muslim women were being targeted in airports and in other places. So the idea was, well, let's shut down the airport. If they're going to search every Muslim, you know, nobody's going to get through. It was the point of being in solid, invisible solidarity. 
And so um, as students are at finals, I emailed her to let her know that we were gonna do it. And I didn't hear back from her. So I went home that night and I typed up the Facebook post and wore the hijab um, in the post and then wore it every day afterwards throughout the season of Advent, which for those on the liturgical calendar who are Baptist, um, it's more than Christmas Sunday, right? It goes through January, which is why some people keep their lights up longer than you think they should, because it's still the season. It's still the season. So I had to learn that after I moved out of this place. But anyway, I still love my Baptist Thank you. Um, one of the things that came out in your film was the role of strong women in your life that um, and just really imparted upon you faith, but also the ability to stand up for those who um, aren't having a voice. Um, and so, you know, just looking at, at your mom, just be able to say, um, I think many of us in the room were with her when she said uh, her comment about the costume and hobbling, about the power of working women, and I'm sorry, I'm working a job. <laughs> but the strong women that, that have uh, built you and the women that were around you Linda here that, that hold you up and the women that you were standing in solidarity of, were there many women at Wheaton in uh, faculty that stepped up and shared their voice in support of you and what you were doing? Um, well, one of, for me personally, the day that I put the hijab on December 10th um, was the last week of class. So when I arrived at class, uh, school on the 11th, which was the last day of class, um, I know there was one female colleague who wore a hijab that day. Um, and there was a picture, there was uh, there were two students that I know of who wore hijabs that day. Um, and in terms of other kinds of support, women did offer other kinds of support, but as Linda will tell you, it was very hard for her to get any women to go on camera um, for fear of various things. But that became a nationwide campaign, including some of my students at Oklahoma City University, the best university in Oklahoma. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, I have to say that. This is what I have to describe. <laughs> also teach at St. Paul, the best seminary in Oklahoma. That became a nationwide campaign, uh, including some, I, I teach interfaith and pluralism. And part of the social experiment my students have to do is to actually embody the other. And I have a lot of my female students uh, actually would wear the hijab. And one of them actually was assaulted at a 7-Eleven in Oklahoma City, right across from Oklahoma City University. It was a big story in Oklahoma City because of what you had done. So you certainly sparked not only a conversation, but I think also a movement in the idea that we don't have to be limited by barriers and walls that society has told us are there. We can actually cross over that fence um, and see the other person and stop seeing the other as other, but that they are also human and I am human and they have a creator and we have a creator and it's all beautiful. And I think that's a conversation that we continue to struggle with here in Oklahoma. Um, and so, you know, Mom, I would ask you too, I mean, what are ways that, that we as Christians, for those of us in the room who identify that way, how can we take that next step towards conversation and um, relationship and dialogue and solidarity? How do, we, how do we take that next step and say, you know, I'm, I'm feeling pulled this way, I'm scared, I don't know what the next step is. How do we, how do we partner together? I, I saw Ibu Patel in one of these, uh, you know, Ibu Patel uh, Interfaith Youth Corps is um, one of the Oklahoma City University campus, one of the better together campuses in the whole state of Oklahoma. And um, uh, him and I agree <coughs> one statement, we call it education, attitude, and relationship. Um, I grew up in Christian schools. Um, the reason many of the organizations in Oklahoma bear the name of mercy is because the nun that took care of me was Ms. Rahman, and her name literally translates to mercy. Um, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't, you know, help it but relate to the issue he's talking about. Can I wear a hijab as a Christian woman? 
the word hijab actually appears in the Quran in the story of Mary. The first time God asked Mary to seclude herself away from people, that word is hijab. So, um, in, in many instances, um, the nuns that wear hijab, we might not call it hijab, uh, Orthodox Jewish women wear hijab. Um, uh, you know, the, 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 the educational part of the formula is for us to understand we are literally brothers from different mothers. If you're talking about Muslims as being the other, uh, we're talking about the story of Hagar and Ishmael. Genesis 21 that talks about Abraham's wife Sarah could not give any children. She asked him to take this other woman. By the way, this other woman was African. Hagar was Egyptian. And then Hagar begot it for him Ishmael. This is all biblical Hebrew scripture, Old Testament, for those of you who are sitting here today. Um, but the story goes, it's not the same Muslim story, it's a little bit different that, you know, Hagar would not banish, I actually said I would not banish Hagar, but from Ishmael comes Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And, you know, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity has so much in common that there is more to unite us than divide us. Um, the question always, always, uh, I ask my students the first day in class, if you're a Christian who lives in a majority um, a Muslim country, what kind of laws do you want to pass? And if I have time, I tell you that uh, one of our students at Oklahoma State University, he was not only white, he was Irish white, so I call him red. <laughs> that he actually wanted, fell in love with this Lebanese Muslim girl overseas, and his parents were really scared to go overseas to Lebanon to ask for her hand. So his mother asked me, to go with him to Lebanon. And I did. It was a simple story. We, the moment we landed in Lebanon, the odds changed. I was the privileged brown Muslim, and he was the minority white American. And then I used my brown privilege to help him out, get married. Now they're both in Oklahoma, and they have two children, and one on the way. Uh, they're all married. But to make a long story short, you know, it's a family. We, we, we're, we're a family of people who believe, Muslims believe in the virgin birth of Jesus, his ascension to heaven, coming back towards the end of time. Mary is the only female name mentioned in the Quran by name. And when we refer to the idea of the people of the book, I like the, uh, you know, when we refer to the people of the book, especially uh, uh, in a loving way, it's mentioned in the Quran in a very loving way. Anytime Muslims talk about uh, Jesus or Mary or Moses. Moses is the most mentioned prophet in the Quran. Uh, and also, bring that home, the vast majority of American Muslims, 33%, are African Americans. From Muhammad Ali uh, to Kareem Abdul Jabbar to uh, you know, Malcolm X, um, whom we are remembering his assassination just two days ago, 55, 55th assassination. So Islam has been a a big part of the American story. And, and, and you know, Judaism and Christianity Islam, yes, we worship the same God. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that we worship the same God. I was in a panel discussion one time with Dr. Wolf at uh, Oklahoma Christian University, and one person said, Muslims do not worship the same Judeo-Christian God because they don't have the concept of Trinity in their concept of God. Well, that sounds pretty good for three seconds until the rabbi looks at him and says, well, I guess we don't worship the same God. <laughs> it's the whole idea of praying to make the Muslims look like the other. I think a lot of times, you know, what has separated us as humans for generations and generations is trying to dehumanize the other. And um, I think that's something that you've confronted several times in your conversation in this film is you, can, you talked about shame and how shame was used against you and used against those around you to try and strip you of even your very faith. People questioning what it was you actually believed in your family commenting. They didn't actually know you. None of the words that was being printed or put out on the screens represented who you were. But we can often use shame to dehumanize one another and to separate us from each other. Um, how do you see 
the world in 2020 as we're upon a new election and a new political season, um, how do we begin to really confront what's right in front of us that really hasn't changed much in these six years, five years? Um, how, do we, how do we continue this conversation that you kicked off, that you started? How can we take that banner and, and carry it forward? <clears throat> So she's asking me to solve all this. <laughs> I think we do it by finding ourselves in other people. Um, I think you can't embody solidarity unless you actually grasp something that's really at the very heart of the Judeo, um, the Islamic Judeo-Christian nexus, which is we're all created in the image of the divine. Um, and I, I'm just not convinced that we believe that. That every human has God breath. That same primordial clay, right? Because if we did, and I think Jesus says it well, um, she who is forgiven much loves much. We have all been forgiven much in our lives, whoever we are, wherever we're from, whatever we believe or don't believe, about religion and everything else, about politics, whether you have an R or a D or an I next on your voter ID card. Like, none of that matters. None of it. What matters is you bowing to the divine, greeting the person who's next to you as having that divine breath in them. If you don't see that, you don't see much. If you haven't gotten that, you haven't gotten a darn thing about what it means um, to live and move and how we're being. And I think that what, what Christianity and I think what the world's great religions teach is radical neighbor love. Um, and we talk about it, people trot out the golden rule, um, but I don't think many people are willing to live it. Um, I think the example of Jesus is a radical pouring out on behalf of the most oppressed. And I believe that if we really see the other, we cannot see suffering and not be moved. If we really see the other person as just like us, we will all face suffering in our lives, on different levels to be sure. But if we see a neighbor, and who is my neighbor? I think we should ask, who is my enemy? Like, no one should be our enemy to begin with. If everyone's our neighbor, no one's our enemy. Um, as far as it's up to me, no one's my enemy. You can call yourself my enemy. But if I live in a way that you are my neighbor, and that radical love has to be outpoured from me toward you because we're in it together, then it changes the calculus. It changes the politics. Um, people can laugh at Marianne Williamson all they want. Do you know what she introduced to the political conversation this year? What does it look like to love with our politics? What does it look like to love as we do politics? St. Augustine asked the same question. We call it just war. What does it look like to love your enemy during war? Right? Um, and I think we've lost sight of those fundamental truths. And so in order um, for us to move close to one another, it has nothing to do with politics and it has everything to do with putting on a hijab. And by that I mean the concept of hijab, a hijabi told me once for her, what she has learned um, about hijab is that Hijab means honoring God with my body. And Christians call that, Apostle Paul calls that putting on God's armor. Um, we are more alike than we are different. We are alike. We share everything in common. Um, and we just don't believe that, so we're not willing to risk on behalf of the other who is us. We're not willing to find ourselves in our Muslim neighbor because we think they must be so different um, from that. So um, it sounds really simple, because it is. And it's also really hard. <coughs> I'd like to um, build on that as well, because I'm sure that there are at least a few people in the room um, who 
for Christians who worry about um, they worry about theology and they worry about losing their um, their understanding of who Jesus is and um, you know Jesus' role in the Christian faith. And I grew up in a very evangelical household, so I understand that. I understand that nervousness of you know getting worried like, hey, if we get too much in common, then we're going to lose Jesus, and everybody's going to forget you know who Jesus is. And there's sort of this uh, sort of irrational fear that comes out of that. And I would like to encourage people that struggle with that that if your theology is more important than your ability to see someone else's humanity, then you might need to rethink your theology. And I say that because one thing, as we've gone around the country with this film, um, one thing that really struck me recently, in New York we had a screening and the Muslim panelists said very tearfully, she said, I have had Christians say to me, we don't worship the same God. And she said, what is so wrong with me that we don't even have the same creator? And that is actually what you're saying. If you say that we don't even share the same creator, then you really are saying to somebody in your lesson, I know that there are some people who are very open in their beliefs that Muslims are less than human, but that's problematic, to, to Larisha's point. So I, I, I just say that, that it's something to really think about, that the, the issue of whether we worship the same God, um, it, it's really important that if you can't say that, you've got to find a way to say it. You have to come to a point of saying we have the same creator, because if you don't, you really land in a frightening place. I think that's a powerful word. Uh, when I had gone to seminary at St. Paul School of Theology, yes. <laughs> uh, one of the first things that I was told is, hold on, over the next three years we're going to dismantle your faith. We will give it back to you by the time you graduate. And that was very scary for many of us. And for me, going into seminary, um, I knew Jesus, I loved Jesus, but I didn't, I couldn't tell you all of the stuff. And so everything I had to learn was there for me to learn. Um, so, but they dismantled things, and it was important, but it was scary because things that had been simple belief to me since childhood, I was getting pushed back. And, and then that was terrifying, and yet so freeing because I was able to ask the questions that I hadn't asked before, and I was able to dig deeper. And I think part of what you're asking us to do is to question some of those things, to be able to have discussions that might be scary to some of us who've never dug into those deep conversations and be willing to say, I could be wrong. I might be wrong about that person. And maybe, just maybe, the God that was so wise in creating me could have been so wise in creating my brother and my sisters, and that there's something beautiful here. And when when we have the courage and the vulnerability to step forward and, and to allow ourselves to go deeper in our faith and to really truly question them, we get the gift back, the gift of love that um, is true and honest and pure. Um, what's next for you? What's up ahead now? What's next? You have dreams, goals, next thing you want to accomplish, next thing you want to do? So um, I have a three-year contract at the University of Virginia. Um, it's not a tenure track job, and so I'm trying to figure out what does it mean to continue to be in higher education, which is actively changing. Um, something like 48% of all jobs are what we call contingent faculty, meaning they're non-tenure. Um, so as that changes, I'm trying to think, well, how do I change and flex creatively as well? Um, so a friend of mine said, well, what you need to figure out is how to have virtual tenure. Um, sometimes that means moving around to different institutions a lot. They might be very um, 
a wonderful institutions, but it means a lot of mobility and not being in one place. Um, <clears throat> so trying to figure out um, long term the academic piece. Um, I am writing currently um, an essay that will be the first glimpse of my book that people will see for a magazine called The Comment. It's a culture magazine at the it's a magazine at the intersection of culture and art and, and religion and politics. And um, in addition to that, I'm continuing my research um, on the classes you saw, um, on Trump and Tea Party women and, and that Make America Great Again, um, kind of rebirth of a white Christian nation stuff. Um, and continuing to travel and, and do some work with an NGO in Rwanda that's reconciling Hutus and Tutsis. And really that's what inspired Embodied Solidarity. When you see um, people sitting next to each other like these two women, and she, let's assume, she didn't, but killed every person of this person's, every member of this person's family save two. And they've chosen to live in community and forgive one another. When you see people choose to live in solidarity with one another like that, it changes your life. If they can, if people can forgive genocide, what have we got to forgive? Someone voted for someone we don't like? Someone borrowed your lawnmower 20 years ago and broke it and never paid to fix it? I mean, seriously, it changed my life. Sitting under a tree in August in Rwanda, and knowing that as a country, we did very little. It's not the writing was on the wall, the blood was everywhere. And we saw it on the nightly news. And we didn't do anything. And I was sitting at Rice University in an East African history class, studying about Rwanda while a genocide was going on. Fast forward 15, 16 years at Wheaton College, and I visit Rwanda, and I meet people who are doing what Jesus calls his people to do. To love radically like that. To radically pour out your life for your neighbor and beyond that for your enemy. And so I stayed up all night that night typing notes on my cell phone um, about this thing that I saw. Radical and, and radical moving toward one another. And I'm telling you, if genocide survivors and perpetrators can live together, share a cow together, share the milk with their enemy, and not assume they're gonna die from poison because it's their enemy, and then share that milk and it becomes the lifeblood of their community, and this is rehearsed over and over <coughs> and over, and we are the most privileged country in the world, we don't even know our neighbors. Well, we've got work to do. And that's what Embodied Solidarity came from, and that's what it's about. And I go to Rwanda to learn how to be more human. So we have to figure out where are the places that we need to go where people who you think have nothing to teach you can teach you what it means to be more human. And I think that's what will change the world, that's what will change our politics, and it will change us. And it has to start with us. So that's what's next for me, continuing to learn how to be human. Thank you. Thank you for teaching each of us how to be more human. Um, and thank you for giving us a mirror to look into um, and for challenging us to challenge the way we look and the way we think and the way we talk. Thank you to each one of you up here. Um, I am so glad to learn from each of you and to be a better human today because of your presence here and all that you've shared. Um, and uh, like I said, we could be here. I could sit and talk to all three of you for hours. Um, but let's thank them for their time and their Can honesty. I say thank you, thank you. you all taught me. I don't know all of you here, but so many of you taught me what it looks like to be human. I hope we meet all my life. To put me in here. Yay for the cell phone, but maybe it's not right. But I said we find ourselves in other people, and um, many of you here, um, I have learned what it's like to be a friend, to be a student, to be a daughter, to be a granddaughter, 
to be a sister, to be loved by my friend's parents, um, to meet people who were in the community and maybe read about me in the paper when I got my nerdy academic letter jacket or whatever. Um, but remember me from back in the day. Um, you make you make me who I am. We find ourselves in others, and I find myself in you. And it's such an honor and a privilege to be here in my home and to be with you. It's no greater privilege.